Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me, um, let me welcome you um, here to the Institute of Peace. Um, we're very pleased to, to have you join us. Uh, uh, there will be a couple of more people coming in um, as, as we speak. Um, traffic is still a little bit of a challenge here. Not for our main speaker here. Um, uh, Alex Walcourt is coming from Boston, um, a, a city that is used to this kind of snow, uh, unlike the city we're living in. Uh, can deal with it, so he has absolutely no problem. And is surprised at the uh, at the difficulty that we're facing. But um, here we are. Uh, we're very pleased to to have this discussion: money, war, and the business of power in the Horn of Africa. Um, Institute of Peace um, has focused on a range of these kinds of issues uh, over our 30 years. Uh, we're now in our fourth decade, um, and it's been uh, a, a challenge in every area. Uh, no bigger challenge than in Africa, and no bigger type of challenge than the corruption and the influence of money uh, that we're going to be talking about here today. Um, the money and political transactions uh, play a big role in any political system, and the, and the political marketplace is developing in the Horn of Africa is a troubling one. Uh, networks of patronage and bargains are increasingly over, increasing, replacing other forms of governance. Horn of Africa is already home for some of the highest corruption risk countries in the world, including Sudan, South, Sud South Sudan as well, Eritrea and Somalia. Patterns of monetized patronage and bargaining is increasingly pervasive across society from local, provincial, and interstate relations. More troubling is that these political systems are increasingly militarized. Across the Horn, defense spending is growing. Since 2005, total defense spending across the African continent has increased by 91%. And due to a lack of documentation and transparency, many of these institutions are largely exempt from scrutiny or accountability. So it's this combination that's creating a paradigm that perpetuates the cycles of fragility that leads to violent conflict, which is what the Institute of Peace focuses on, violent conflict, that have plagued the region for decades. Bargains struck to allocate and reallocate resources and alliances are potential spoilers for peace agreements that are reached or will be reached in countries after conflict like Sudan and South Sudan. So this is a great opportunity this morning to take a look at this range of issues. And our panel uh, here, which Ambassador Lyman will introduce uh, in, in his turn, um, is well suited to help us talk this through. We look forward to your questions and comments. Um, we have here today a, a great group of people, both sitting here um, as well as sitting up here, um, that have been assembled uh, by Susan Stigand um, and her team. Uh, she directs our Africa program. She's sitting right back there, there's Susan, and her team. Um, we have uh, Ambassador Johnny Carson, who is also a part of that team, uh, known, known well to uh, everyone in this room. Uh, so Ambassador Carson and Ambassador Lyman uh, uh, are, are great assets for the Institute of Peace in our, in our Africa program. Um, so uh, please welcome um, Ambassador Princeton Lyman to uh, kick off uh, this discussion. Prince, Ambassador Lyman. Oh. <clears throat> Well, thank you. thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for coming on this uh, difficult day to move around in. I'm very grateful we have a good group because we have a very important discussion here today. Uh, I'm going to be very brief in the introductions of the panel, uh, so we may have maximum time for discussion. But the uh, focus of, of this uh, discussion is uh, Alex DeWall's new book, The Real Politics of the Horn of Africa, Money, War, and the Business of Power. This this is not your, to borrow a phrase, this is not your father's book on the Horn of Africa. It's, uh, it's different and distinctive. Uh, Alex is, uh, as many of you know, probably the foremost scholar, or certainly one of the foremost scholars on the, for, the Horn of Africa. As young as he looks, he's been involved in it for at least 30 years, uh, did his PhD on the problems of Darfur, has worked on aspects of HIV, governance, and 
poverty. But he's both a scholar and a practitioner. He was a member of the Africa, he was an advisor to the Darfur Peace Talks. He was the uh, member of the Africa Union Mediation Team for Darfur, and very recently senior advisor to the Africa Union High Level Implementation Panel uh, to complete the work of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. So Alex, we're very delighted to have you here. It's going to be very, very good discussion. Following Alex's presentation, <clears throat> uh, we have two commentators. We have Manal Taha. She is a Jennings Randolph Senior Fellow here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Manal is an anthropologist and conflict analyst expert with a wide degree of research in North Africa, Sudan. She's done a lot of work in Sudan. Several research projects there, including qualitative research on land tenure systems and water rights in the Nuba Mountains uh, for the Martin Luther University in Germany. Uh, she's been a lead researcher for the National Center for Research in Khartoum, working on various programs in cultural anthropology. So, Manal, great to have you here. And because money is at stake <clears throat> or involved, uh, we're very delighted to have Brad Brooks Rubin here. Brad is the policy director at Enough. Uh, I think everybody here is uh, familiar with the Enough project. Uh, uh, Brad uh, served as a special advisor for conflict in the U.S. Department of State. He has served at the Treasury Department. He's an expert on things like sanctions and money and movement of money. So we'll have uh, uh, Brad talk about that, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers. So Alex, it's uh, over to you, and we're looking forward to it very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to be at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, as, as one of the occupational hazards of being director of the World Peace Foundation is, is every, everyone assumes that if you work for an organization with peace in its name, you have to be a little bit soft in the head. You have to be either a <laughs> beauty queen or a practitioner of levitation. And as you can see, I'm neither of those, neither of those things. Um, World Peace Foundation, I should say, is, is, is venerable. It was set up in 1910, um, but uh, relatively small. Um, and just uh, three of us attached to the Fletcher School uh, at, at, at Tufts. Now, I have some slides. So those of you who are uh, on very odd angles may, may wish to take this opportunity to sort of shift a little bit. Because I want to um, start off by talking about the cover of the book, because I think this is a book that can be judged by, by its cover. And I'm going to see if this clicker works. I'm going to go through what's in the cover. The first is real politics. Now, by real politics, I don't mean the sort of the, the secrets that can be revealed by those who've been actually at the coalface, though there may be one or two. Uh, I talk about the politics of transactions, and um, which is not something that political scientists do, but something that policymakers and decision makers are always intimately engaged in. And I use this rather nice, pithy definition by Lenin. Who, whom? Who did what to whom? So that's real politics. Now, um, money and war. The cover that my publishers initially wanted was this, yeah. um, to which I resisted. I said, the, you know, what's, what's, what's driving what's happening in the horn is not guns. It's, it's money. And they, I'm glad to say, were very uh, amenable. And, 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 and we got the cover that I, that I wanted, which I'm really, I must say, rather pleased with. I thought it's. <laughs> Uh, it, it, it conveys precisely the right message about the, the significance of, of money. Um, now, I'm talking really about money and politics. Now, corruption, I think, is a sub-theme. What I'm more interested in is political finance, political money, how money drives politics. And this, of course, is a theme that is common not only uh, to, uh, uh, to the Horn of Africa. Here is Senator Mark Hanna. Um, a hundred and something years ago, who is famous for saying, there are two things that are important in politics. The first is money, and I can't remember what the second <laughs> one is. Um, now, the, so, it, and, and, you know, it's, I don't need to remind a Washington audience of the significance <laughs> of, 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 of this. Now, 
a lot of what I describe in the book is uh, derives from the fact that I was, and to some extent still am, as involved, had a sort of front row seat in a number of, of different political processes and so on, as a member of African Union delegations. And I think that perhaps the fact that I was part of an African Union delegation rather than a US government or British government or UN gave more of an immediate feel for, for what was going on because there was a level of candor in the, in the interactions between African leaders with their peers uh, compared to the interactions with outsiders. And one of my uh, main tutors in the real politics was this fellow, Majzoub al-Khalifa, uh, who, who the late Majzoub al-Khalifa, who was the uh, Sudanese party manager and chief negotiator for the Darfur peace talks back in 2005-2006. A man who saw his chief job as identifying the price that needed to be paid for every one of the participants in the peace talks, uh, primarily the rebels on the other side, but also his own delegation. Um, and how much they needed to be paid off, calculating the price and paying them off. He was what the Sudanese like to call a Jalaba politician. The Jalaba being the, the, trade of, the, the class of traders who historically have gone around the Sudanese peripheries and beyond trading in salt and matches, real retail um, uh, merchants. And he was a retail merchant in the field of politics. And what he used to say was what is important in politics is having the political budget, sandu kalsiasi, the political pocket, the money that can be dispensed without needing to be accounted for. Needed for the political market, suk asiasi, the price of loyalty. So the, what was important for him was not just money, but political business skills. And so that is the third element in my, in, 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 in my title, real politics being money, violence, a war business of power. So these are the three, uh, uh, the three sort of animating um, concepts, which are drawn really from the lived experience of political elites. If you like, this is an exercise in social anthropology and ethnography of these elites, um, not only in Sudan but uh, but elsewhere uh, in the region. Uh, and, and, and these are the, the indicators that they themselves use in a discussion with a security uh, or senior security official, political business manager, and they are making an assessment of the viability of a, of a politician, a political movement, or a state. They won't read you know, the foreign policy or um, you know, fragile states index. They won't look at those indicators derived by you know, State Department or, or, or whatever. They, this is what they will use. How much money, political money, does that individual have? What is the price of loyalty? Is it going up, down? Can it be afforded? Um, and what are the political skills uh, that that individual um, um, uh, has? How many people does he know? And it's very much a male thing. It's, it, 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 it's almost entirely men running this, running this show. And, the, and then the other contributory um, uh, concept is turbulence. The, and there's an old joke in, uh, in, in Sudan, which is it changes week by week, but you go back after 10 years and it's exactly the same. And, and it, it has the characteristics that you have um, for, um, for, with a, 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 a flow when you open a faucet, when you open a tap, and a unpredictable, chaotic from one moment to the next, but retains a recognizable structure over a period of time. And the, so the, the, the political business skill that is required is not one of building institutions. It's not one of state building, of, long, of, of, of predicting how things will work out in the long term. It is one of managing this type of, of, of immediate turbulent uh, flow. Um, for those of you who are academics, this is a nice quote from an uh, economic historian, Jane Geyer, who is challenging our sort of intellectual homing instinct on what is stable, on institutions, on regularities, um, on, on, on those long, on principles of long-term stability. She says the stable, cumulative, systemic concept of institutions becomes blunt and illogical when applied to a reality that seems, to those who live it, altogether less settled. The requirement, she said, is to apply reason and judgments to horizons of contingency rather than applying a narrow, calculative rationality to given variables. And I think 
I mean, one of, one of, one of the, the, the problems with much of the policy literature that's developed by political scientists uh, and indeed by, uh, by think tanks is it doesn't uh, take account of the, uh, that uncertainty, that turbulence. And another nice quote I have is from Jean-Marie Gehenna, you know, one of the supreme sort of political intellectuals, somebody who really read a great deal. But when in, you know, when in, in high office at the UN, he said he, he, he was uninterested in reading political science or indeed what crisis group or whoever was producing. What he needed, he said, was the fraternal companionship of other actors before me who had had to deal with confusion, grapple with the unknown, and yet had made decisions. And so in a way, um, in, in looking at political business strategies under situations of turbulence, what I'm trying to do is elucidate the types of lessons, the types of practical lessons that can be learned from those who are actually are the skilled practitioners of this craft, who are actually on top of it. Because as outsiders, we will never be as skilled at managing uh, Sudan as the Sunni or Sudanese, at managing Somalia as the, as, as, as the Somalis. Um, but we can perhaps derive uh, a few lessons um, from, from looking at that. Let me very briefly, um, none of you need to know where the Horn of Africa is, but um, a, 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 an interesting remark, which is when I started working on the Horn, it consisted of, um, if we set aside Djibouti, three major countries, which are now de facto five, de jure five, de facto six, if you include Somaliland as, as, as a separate entity. Um, and I know Ambassador Awad will not take offence at any <laughs> at, at any such references like that. Welcome, yeah, yeah Excellency. Um, but I don't want to look at the territorial politics, which are in themselves very, very interesting in in in, in this area. What I'm more interested in is the sort of the organic. Uh, connections, the circuits of power and patronage, the transactional politics that does cross boundaries. And I tried to convey this with, a, with an organic metaphor of, of trees. What we have in the 1970s was we had some geographically located trees which were had sort of dense branches in the central areas of their countries and then a few branches sort of reaching out into their peripheries. Um, and crossing boundaries, the Somali one crossed way into, in, into what was uh, legally, uh, juridically uh, Ethiopia, uh, because of course the Somalis um, invaded, fought a war. By the 1990s, these had really withered the, under the conditions of extreme austerity. The, the, the extent of governance had really, really reduced not just the formal governance of institutions and those of us who, who traveled in these areas. The state was absent in, the, in most rural areas, but also the, the, the patronage of the state was much, much reduced, but very selectively far-reaching. So Khartoum reached deep into Chad, into Central Africa too, um, and so on. And then today, much, much richer, much denser sets of interactions, both within the countries and cross-borders, much more complex cross-border ones. A lot of financial, a lot of political money coming into, um, in, into our region um, in, in the last couple of years from um, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and, 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 and the Emirates. And, and, and if you look at South Sudan, very complicated, a lot of... Um, um, political involvement um, from, uh, from, uh, from the neighbours. So visualise this not, as, not in a realist sense as, as, as blocks which are countries, but as, 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 as trees that are competing for sunlight, fighting for space, and, and, and whose branches are, are, are in, in, intermingled. Um, I also did a little map of, of interstate and transnational conflicts. There's no, really no such thing as an internal war. All these wars involve in one way or another the, the neighbours. They are all very much in, intermixed. So let me get back to the, the business of power. Let me just give a couple of examples from across, uh, across the region. Um, some, uh, some of the political business managers in this region are very skilled. I think uh, President, uh, President Omar al-Bashir is exceptionally skilled. Um, he may not be skilled at the things that we particularly value as, as, as people here in, in, in this city, but he's exceptionally skilled within his own domain. 
um, Siad Barry was moderately skilled and very unlucky, and I'll come on to that. Uh, Salva Kiir, unfortunately, not very skilled. Uh, and Isaias Afawoki um, has his own particular um, set of skills. Um, so let me just run through some of the, uh, the scenarios and how we can analyze their particular political business management strategies in the political market um, using a, a business lens. And I will skip very briefly over this because of um, time constraints. Anyone who's been to, uh, done an MBA and done a business administration will be familiar with Michael Porter's five forces that shape, um, that shape industry. Um, I, I got a student of mine to, to revise this for the five competitive forces that, state, that shape political business, and, and, and this is the chart. And, and, and I think if one begins to, to use the, the, the lens of business management suitably you know, adapted, you know, mutatis mutandis, to uh, political power in this region, one can begin to um, get a much more of a handle on, on how, business, how, how politics is managed and, 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 and how it's likely to, um, to move in the future. And one of the key factors, of course, there is the flow of money, how much money there is coming into the system. And this is, if you like, the master graph of, of Sudan, which is the, I, I haven't got a graph for the political budget of Sudan, but I have a graph for the overall budget, which is a more or less a, a fairly good proxy. And what we see is from the 1970s, right over on the left, it was a threefold increase because of the scale of, of, of the overall chart. You don't see quite how dramatic that threefold increase was under Nimeri. During that increase in the 1970s, made possible by aid and principally by borrowing, it was possible to make peace agreements. It was possible to bring in the South, bring in the sectarian parties, because the cake was expanding, because people could be paid off. When Nimeri's political budget crashed, 1985, he was overthrown. He just didn't have the money to grease the wheels of that patrimonial system. Sadiq al-Mahdi came in, you see that spike in the middle with democratic government, spent lavishly trying to put together a coalition, bankrupted himself in doing so, um, because he was not able, actually, didn't have the skill to put it together. And, and, and when he was forced into austerity, again, he was overthrown. Then for 10 years, the government of Sudan ran a budget, ran on a budget of less than a billion dollars per year. How can you run a country, the largest country in Africa, in the middle of a war with, at that time, 30 million people? on less than a billion dollars a year. Well, it's very interesting. I'll come on to that. And then 1999, oil. Suddenly they got oil. The budget went from 900 and something million to uh, 11.5 billion in the matter of six years. A 12, 13-fold increase. Enormous increase. It was that that made possible the comprehensive peace agreement the Eastern Sudan peace agreement, all the, all the agreements were possible when you had this massive increase in budget. Budget stalls, no deals. Basically, the, you know, the, the rule of thumb in Sudan, if you want a peace deal, expand the budget and centralize power. You have to have a decent political manager. Um, very sort of rudimentary rule of, 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 of political business management. So let me just go through how those political markets were structured in, in, in four different eras of, of, of Sudanese history. The first is Nimeri. He, he ran a, a, a fit, as far as he could, a centralized patronage system. Borrowing and aid came in at the top, World Bank, USAID, the Gulf states. He bought and he exchanged access to those resources for loyalty with intermediate elites, secular elites, the southerners, the, the army, etc., etc. The one political player in Sudan who had independent source, significant independent source of political financing was Hassan al-Turabi through the Islamic banks that were set up in 1977-78. And the, 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 the Islamic banks were, and still are, political banks par excellence. They directly funded his party. So he had that, so over there, that, 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 that symbol on the top right, the green symbol, that is the, 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 the um, Faisal Islamic Bank, directly was able to fund Turabi. And guess what? He's the one who inherited power. 
precisely because of his ability to control the political finance uh, of the country ultimately. Let me skip over Sadiq al Mahdi because his, his, his was both uh, uncertain and messy, his chart. It was not possible to put his chart on a single slide. Then we have this very, very interesting decade of the 1990s when Sudan was run on $900 million a year. And how was it run? And there, and, there, and there were actually several parallel channels of political finance. And I simplified them to three. On the far left are the, the, Islamic, the Islamic finance through banks, through Islamic foundations. And it's interesting that the second most influential Islamist in the country, Ali Osman Mohammed Taha, was put in charge of Ministry of Social Affairs. In what government do you have the number two in charge of social affairs? Well, if he is actually has his hands on possibly the most significant source of political finance, which is extraterritorial Islamic finance, that's a very good place to put him. So he can actually use that money to, to further the Islamic project and, 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 and do, do all sorts of necessary things. Then you have down the middle the Central Bank of Sudan and, and uh, Abdul Rahim Mohammed Hamdi who was the Minister of Finance, who for many years in the mid-1990s ran a cash budget. Believe it or not, every month they used to count up the numbers, the amount of currency they had in the central bank and, 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 and make that allocation accordingly. Imagine running a government on, uh, on a cash basis. Well, he, he did it. Impressed the World Bank and IMF no, no end, but uh, they, they weren't able to normalize relations because they were on the terrorist list. And then, you, and then you had the, the, the military finance that came from various sources, including Iran, which was handled separately by the national intelligence and some of the military intelligence people. And as the sort of the, um, the two sort of, um, what's the right word, the, the sort of conductors of this, of, of, of this orchestra, you have Hassan al-Turabi and, 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 and Bashir, who are, who are managing this. Not as dictators, but as, 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 as conductors. And then when oil began to come on, on, on stream, they had, a, they had a contest, Bashir won, and you had a highly centralized system of political finance. Because all the, well, not all of it, the, the great majority of political finance came from oil, and you had this bargaining, exchange of resources for loyalty and cooperation. Then the oil went away, or most of it went away, and you get something akin to the previous system again recurring, where you have different political sources of political finance at the top um, and different competitors. And the significance of this, I would say, is that some of the Islamists directly get money from Qatar in particular. And our poor friends in the SPLM North don't have any external source of political finance. Um, as a as, as special envoy for Sudan and South Sudan, I'm sure you were not allowed to put money in their pocket directly. And we were accused of doing something. You were accused of, I mean, had you been able to, had you been <laughs> able to do what the Qataris did, then, then it might have made a difference. But as it is, they're basically orphaned in the system, as you see. They're, they're, you know, they're supplicants rather than having, uh, uh, having a real substantive role in, 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 in this political market. So Bashir now has a double bargain. He has to bargain with his his, his, his suppliers as well as with his, his, his supplicants. And currently, his main bargaining is with Egypt and Saudi Arabia. And, and, and he's going along with them for reasons that will be obvious to all of you. Now, one of the consequences of this is, consequences of this is a particular function of violence. Violence um, has many forms in this type of, of, of political system, and one of them uh, not the only one, but one of them is laying claim to these resources through, through, through uh, advertising your presence and advertising your strength in a political market. There's a nice quote from a, a Marielle Debo, who's a superb anthropologist who studied Chadian. Um, uh, uh, Chadian military commanders and rebels. And her book is, is, is out in French. It's going to be out in English um, uh, later this year. And she writes, war belongs to politics. Violence derives from the situation <coughs> rather than from radical enmity. War is waged because there are enemies. Oh. Sorry, war is not waged because there are enemies. There are enemies because war is waged. And anyone who's worked in Sudan or indeed in Chad will notice that 
members of the political elite are incredibly cordial and courteous to each other. Because tomorrow's, just as today's friend can be tomorrow's enemy, to, today's enemy can be tomorrow's friend. They don't hate each other. They may kill one another's followers on the battlefield, but actually the violence and the, and the talking go uh, ha, uh, hand in hand. In fact, uh, the violence is, is a handmaiden um, to, the, um, to the talking. And we see that in the way that the Darfur War evolved. Um, and, uh, and this is from 2003 to the current day. This is the number of violent fatalities in Darfur. Not overall fatalities, you know, deaths from hunger and so on. These are violent fatalities as monitored by the armed conflict location and event um, data set. Probably an underestimate, but not by a great deal. And you see the big spike, 2003, 2004, when the massacres were going on, which incidentally, the members of the Sudanese security elite will candidly say, we made a mistake, we miscalculated the price, we, we got it wrong, we could have paid these guys off, we were, we were too mean when we could have bought them in. Violence got out of hand. But then you see it bumping along you know, for you know, eight or nine years, there was more recently a bit of a surge. But um, during that period, a, an incredibly complex mosaic of violence. When you try and map this violence, you get that number of actors and that number of incidents. This is from a couple of years ago. It's, it, it's a pattern that doesn't make sense. The only way of making sense of this pattern is by identifying the individuals who are behind each of the sets of initials and their particular interests and the way they are using violence to, um, uh, to, um, to uh, promote their cause. Let me uh, move on very quickly because I want to speak a little bit about some of the other countries. Um, South Sudan, I, uh, this was a, a, a cartoon we commissioned uh, last year in which, which has uh, a, a a version of that sort of centralized political market chart with, with Bashir, with their, their Salva Kiir, saying, I need your support. I have the cash, name your price, and it's all coming out of the oil. And then all, all, all the members of the political elite making their, uh, making their demands. The, 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 the full cartoon is on the World Peace Foundation website. And then what happens when the money runs out? They they find. And, and basically the, the, the collapse of South Sudan is, is in my view not only, I mean the underlying cause is it was a kleptocratic system, but it, the key reason for the collapse was it was a mismanaged kleptocratic system. You can actually manage a, a kleptocratic system quite well um, so as to minimize conflict or, or, or maintain a modicum of stability and, and many political leaders around the world have done that. Unfortunately, um, Salva Kiir was not able to achieve that. Um, so in the eyes of his peers, Salva Kiir's error was not stealing money. It was, it, 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 it was, it was um, doing it in a very clumsy way. Um, let me look at Somalia briefly. Um, this is, this is the, the, the chart that I developed for, for Siad Barrett. Now, Siad Barry's misfortune was that he was not able ever to regulate this, the Somali political market. He was not able to control the price of loyalty. So that, interestingly, in comparison to Nimeri, who, who was overthrown when he lost that political budget, Siad Barry never lost his political budget. He always had money. The problem was the price of loyalty was bid up by outsiders so that he could, no longer, he, he, uh, he could no longer control it. And as it was bid up, corruption became so entrenched that it was an entitlement rather than uh, in, in allowing people to be corrupt. He was not buying their loyalty. They were just saying, OK, we'll take it. Um, unfortunately, I, I f oh, I, um, unfortunately, I see the current predicament of the federal government of Somalia as not being that different that it is not able to, reg it, it, it is a government that fundamentally is in the same predicament. It has to run on, on, on a patronage basis. And it is not able to control, regulate the price of loyalty at all. In fact, even less so than, uh, uh, than Siad Barre was some um, 30 years ago. So uh, the, the, it really is a challenge to, um, to establish political uh, order un uh, under these conditions. And, and I put in a rather provocative extra thing on this, which is I think the, what we're going to see this year is the Gulf Cooperation countries, Gulf Cooperation Council countries coming in with major political funds in advance of the election. Um, 
and, and the, that money, I, I, I expect, will determine the, um, the, out, the, the outcome of the election. That would be the prediction of, the, uh, of this analysis. It would actually make al-Shabaab rather marginal, possibly irrelevant. Um, but uh, it, it, it would give a, a different political trajectory, trajectory to the country. Um, it says Afawaki, his particular skill has been to separate the flows of political money from the, the security establishment. So that the security establishment, the, the, the generals, the uh, security chiefs in Eritrea do not have independent flows of political finance, with a little, one or two little exceptions. Again, the, uh, the flows of money from the Gulf are changing that, uh, dy that dynamic. Ethiopia, very different. Um, and in part, this, um, this book is actually the outcome of almost 25 years of conversations uh, with, with the late Prime Minister Mela Sanawi, and who was developing, theorizing the democratic developmental state for Ethiopia. And my principal argument with him uh, was that he, he, he needed to update his analysis of what he was up against. His idea was that, um, and, and it was sort of caricatured in the World Development Report of 2011, a sort of spiral of growth out of fragility, violence and fragility, into security and developmentalism, as represented by that, uh, by that trend. Um, his, his argument is, is, it can also be schematically represented in this diagram, which is from Mushtaq Khan, one of his uh, intellectual collaborators, who uh, the argument being that there were two possible trajectories from, from a poor developing country to an advanced capitalist country. One being you reform governance first, that is, go along the bottom axis first and then grow, which is basically the, the formula proposed by, internet and by the Western donors. The other being you grow fast and then you reform, which is the one preferred by Mellis. My argument with him was actually there's a third thing you're up against. You are not facing an old-fashioned patronage system, patrimonial system, that will be superseded. You don't need to just get a threshold of, of institutionalization which will lead to a takeoff into a developmental state. You're actually facing a radically updated, modernized, very dynamic political marketplace, which is a modern system of government which will be challenging you. Um, and, and, and could indeed you know, reverse or bring down the process of state building um, that, you, um, th that you have in mind if you are not careful. Um, I will quickly go through the last couple of slides. Um, I had a particular disagreement with him actually on, on Somalia. I felt it was an, uh, an error for him to send his troops in, in, into Somalia um, nine years ago. And then um, what would it mean if the political marketplace is the direction of the future. If contrary to all our expectations, our sort of inbuilt prejudices about uh, the emergence of developmental states of a particular uh, model of development, actually it is this monetized, marketized political system that is the future. What would a more po po competitive political market look like? It would be more integrated regionally and, and globally. It would be dollarized. Um, the institutions would become subordinate to uh, particular political interests. And interestingly, um, violence would be reduced. This is what the model would predict. They would not be reduced to zero. The levels of violence would actually be very hard to eliminate because violence is embedded in the system. But uh, high levels of violence actually are, are dysfunctional in, in a political market. And so you would expect violence to be, um, to be somewhat reduced. How do we get out of it? Uh, maybe we can turn to that in discussion, but I would just suggest two things. First is demand from below mobilizing citizens. And the other is mobilizing the political financiers. And here, just a word about Somaliland, which seems to be a sort of an, a, a, a very interesting anomaly of, of stability in, in, in the region. And I would suggest that the principal reason for that stability is that those in charge of political finance, who were 20 odd years ago the Somaliland business class, 
particularly the livestock traders, the, 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 the bankers, were the ones who determined the political settlement. Basically, I, I see Somaliland to, uh, as a, a profit-sharing agreement, Appendix A, Constitution of the Republic. And, it's an, and, and if the, those in charge of political finance actually get it together to have some form of, of agreement among themselves, to have a particular form of politics, they will get it. And I think that is a lesson that we should reflect upon. So there we have the uh, Somaliland Parliament and the Somaliland currency, which is actually the currency I put on the uh, front cover of the book, to give it a slightly hidden, if optimistic, if, if, if hidden twist. So. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Well, I told you it wasn't your father's book on the horn. <laughs> uh, very good, Alex. Thanks. And it's, uh, I, I have to tell you, it's a very rich, rich book that I recommend to everyone. It's, it's filled with a great deal of both history and analysis. Uh, well, I'll give you a few minutes to comment on this. Yes. Um uh, actually, uh, let me start that when I read the book, I got really scared because <laughs> I'm from Sudan originally, and just to find the reality that this is this is a way, this is the environment our politics is working on, is very scary. Um, first of all, I um, when I read the book, I found I felt like um, Dr. Dual want to us to imagine that we are in a big auction. Okay, political auction, and he likes to call it a marketplace, political marketplace, but for me it was an auction. Who pays more, he will win the politics. And it's for like ordinary citizens from Sudan, it's very scary that our life is in th those hands. Um, for me, the, the, the book uh, has evidence for that, and that is, makes it more complicated. Like for some uh, some evidence that um, Dr. Uh, uh, Dual was uh, speaking about some like in Darfurian rebels in one of the negotiation with uh, um, with uh, Abdul Wahid, uh, he uh, he received a phone call during the peace uh, negotiation for Darfur peace talk, and he said that they offer me 30 million dollars, but I will negotiate for 100 million dollars. Uh, and that is very scary. That means it's about money. Like uh, there is some, a lot of people have beliefs and ideology and a lot of um, uh, political stands and grievances in Darfur. And then it's been uh, it's been handled in the book by by the money. Uh, the, this is examples for uh, what uh, what uh, Dr. Dual is giving is. There is features on every in every political markets which is loyalty could be tradable and rentable for politicians. So it's not about for it's uh, in the marketplace. Uh, re, re, your, re, the reality, the loyalties of politicians is is about money, and it it just follow the money where the money is is going on, and um, and uh, for me is. If I just want to deal with this as a reality, um, I will look back to the content. It's, I feel like it's away from the content itself. When I think when Abdul, Abdul Wahid was offered that money is for, um, for compensation, which is deep rooted in the culture in the in, in the foreign uh, communities. It's uh, what you call it the, the blood money or dia for, for even we call it uh, reconciliation. It's part of reconciliation process in his uh, in the region. So. Uh, I think the way it should be reading that I or I tend to have some way to go away from political markets is it has it has a reasons, you know it has reasons those people that they fought for reasons and they want this money for reasons that legitimate, but legitimate for their own uh, asking or demands, and then uh, also the book is uh, spoke about those um, political traders are everywhere. In the in Horn of Africa, in the Horns of Africa, they are everywhere. There are too many. They are the the smart players. Yes, some of them are very smart. I agree with what you said about uh, President Omar al Bashir. He is managing in a country in a very very limited resources in a in a very long time uh, sa sa international sanctions. 
he, I'm sure he has a very, very rare talent. Um, but at the same time, there is other uh, factors that help him, in my opinion, which is the regional, uh, the, the collapse is happening in the region, the whole situation in Syria, in Libya, in Egypt, after the, specifically after the Arab Spring, people, the uh, Sudanese themselves, they start to look at their neighbors and they said, they're saying like, what we, what we gonna do? Why we are doing any uh, um, moving against the, the regime? And that helped him again to continue and, uh, and uh, managing his uh, existence in Sudan. Uh, Sudan has no money, but he still managed to be strong. I, at least to, uh, the institutions of the government is, is somehow working uh, compared to other neighbors' countries. Um, but at the same time, uh, I, I see, I see uh, there is other there is other loyalties that is not only just money for politicians. Uh, for for example, in southern Sudan, the ethnic and tribal loyalties it's uh, it's something that it's really important for them. So that also can take us away from the only money uh, money part. Um, and then, and also, I'm, um, Dr. Dual connect this marketplace with the international economy, and um, I, 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 I agree with him. This is like very, very um, this uh, smart, and this um, marketplace is very strong with international donors' money. Specifically, money come from like the region of um, Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, China. Uh, they have a lot of money, even the U.S. here, also they have interest and there's a lot of money going uh, on these regimes to continue. And, uh, and uh, in Europe, of course, um, from Europe, the money from EU or from some specific countries. All these three features, which is uh, summarizing the, we can say, the interpersonal skills of um, bargaining, for uh, for what your interest as a politician, how you how you bargain to get money, and how you bargain to get your interest is a part of the the features that all these three countries are sharing. Plus, um, uh, is there are too many, as he said, but still we have some people that they are not really some politicians. They are not really working in this marketplace, and still and they manage to hold it for a long time. For example, we have. Um, Yusuf Kuwa in Nuba Mountain, he was not really compromised his beliefs, you know. And uh, you have many other politicians that uh, stood again at this, um, I will call it corruption, you know. It's, uh, it's, the book didn't say it's corruption, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a part of the, the whole corruption is going on in, in the world. Uh, for 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 uh, for us, I think as a, yeah, as, a, as people pra uh, practitioners in the democratic and governance system, this book is really um, you should be worried about that because it seems, it seems that the uh, nation building approach or uh, institutions um, capacity building institutions it may not work. So that's also the question we'll ask. And the last question is like, where we go? Like, how we can break these visual cycles? You know, we need to know some answers. At least we start. Thank you. Thanks, Miral. Right. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Ambassador Lyman. Thanks to the U.S. Institute of Peace for the opportunity uh, to be on this uh, distinguished panel and in a distinguished audience. Uh, if I may, Ambassador, I want to two slight amendments to your introduction. Uh, I was the special advisor for conflict diamonds at the State Department. Uh, that, uh, ah. that modification is, uh, it was already big enough, but at least that modifies it to a little bit. Kimberly and um, process. Exactly, yeah, okay. uh, Kimberly process. Sorry. No, that's okay. Um, I used to glibly refer to myself at times as the special advisor for people fighting over rocks when I was at the State <laughs> Department, which is not to diminish the impact of the conflict, but at least to narrow the types of conflicts I worked on. Um, and uh, in addition to being the policy director of Enough, I'm also policy director of our joint initiative called The Century, which is an initiative of the Enough Project, Not On Our Watch, and an organization called C4ADS. And it's really through that lens that I'll try to pick up on uh, where Manal left off with just sort of what do we what do we do from here. Uh, and the century analysis of the five countries that we work on flows from much the same starting point that Alex laid out uh, today and in his book. 
um, politics and governance has been captured or hijacked by, the, by this marketplace and that understanding and impacting the networks involved in that capture are the keys to effective policy and, act, and action moving forward. Uh, as the century, we see this through a term we call violent kleptocracy, where the criminal networks running government do not simply exploit the system, but rather capture and become the system, working through layers of perpetrators, facilitators, and enablers. The kleptocratic network then relies on violence, sometimes in overt and horrific ways, but leading to uh, atrocities, but in other cases, as Alex noted at the end of his talk, uh, on a more limited or indirect basis, uh, where the threat of violence looms but is not actually needed uh, to be enacted. So from the century perspective, we aim to pick up the story and act on it from there. Uh, we work as practitioners to try to impact the way these particular political marketplaces that are functioning as violent kleptocracies actually operate, focusing our efforts as much as possible uh, on what Alex, uh, in his book, uh, lays out as the fourth variable of real politics, uh, which is the integration back into the global marketplace. Put another way, there may be a competition within a subset of actors in these political marketplaces, but the systems as a whole function closer to monopolies, and as such will likely fail or at a minimum create disastrous consequences for their consumers. For the century, looking at integration back into the global marketplace means the global political and the global financial marketplace, because in the end, the rents and the proceeds of what is gained in the dynamics that Alex describes in the political marketplace will almost always have to come back these days to the global financial system. Uh, although the political entrepreneurs and operators may focus their efforts on maintaining local, national, and regional systems to maintain their kleptocratic networks, they need to move the proceeds elsewhere. And that's where the opportunity comes in if we can mobilize more effectively than we have in the past. The global political and especially the global financial marketplaces have evolved substantially in the last 10 to 15 years, at least with respect to the tools that they use to regulate themselves. Effective use of the regulatory tools in place requires two key steps. One is political will, direction, and understanding, much of which we, gain from, we can gain from uh, Alex's book, and actionable information. The trouble is that in many cases when we speak about this particular region, those who understand the political context and political aims and policy aims do not necessarily have familiarity with the regulatory tools, and conversely, those who understand the tools generally have little to no experience in the region meaning that little to nothing gets done other than what are often superficial steps with no follow through, uh, the mediator's curse that Alex refers to in his book. Our aim with the century is to fill those gaps so that the relevant policymakers who understand the local political marketplaces know what tools to exist that can impact those marketplaces and the market regulators know a bit more about how to effectively apply what, the, what tools we have in those situations. In terms of the first step, political will <clears throat> and direction, this must always be the starting point. Identification of clear foreign policy goals must define how we move forward. Within the U.S. system, there is often frustration in places like the Treasury Department and the Justice Department when the foreign policy machinery cannot agree on what we want to achieve in a particular country because we have competing ideas about who those actors are and what those actors are seeking to achieve in their political marketplaces. Alex's vignettes in his book demonstrate this very well, especially around the case of Sudan. Unfortunately, without clear political will and direction, the regulatory tools themselves become the policy and as such will almost always fail because they are deployed to achieve something they cannot. But once we have appropriate direction and will, we can start to use the tools provided we have what is essentially the second step, accurate and actionable information. The efforts of the century uh, and, our, and our partners now are to develop, uh, to develop, an, <coughs> excuse me, develop um, investigative networks and, and data analysis tools uh, from the ground to fill those information gaps. Transaction documents, corporate structure and beneficiary information, details from the ground about how those, the day-to-day -day activities within these marketplaces. These are what regulators need not to not only to deploy the tools, but then to implement and enforce them, as we have seen happen in other contexts. 
When I was at Treasury in the State Department, we often did not have anything like this kind of information for countries like Sudan or the DRC, for example. Uh, I know outside the horn, but a country relevant to, to our work. This takes time, patience, resources, consistent and focused effort to check and recheck what you have to ensure that you can act on it and it is the most useful and actionable information. So if we can actually develop the right political will and this type of actionable information, what tools do we have to try to impact the political marketplaces, the violent kleptocracies that, uh, that we focus on today? I'll list three or four very quickly, as I know I have uh, kind of a limited amount of time. Uh, the first is modernized sanctions. Most of the discussion around sanctions when it comes to Sudan and the Horn is limited to the comprehensive form that we have in place related to Sudan, which is really a vestige of, uh, of older models, or asset freezes and travel bans that are placed on certain individuals. These are both old models in what is an ever-changing marketplace when you look uh, of sanctions tools. Individualized sanctions themselves have actually only been in place, uh, used for about 20 years, but are now understood well enough by those that they impact that they can often be circumvented unless effective enforcement is in place, which it often is not. But we now have modernized tools for sanctions, <clears throat> such as sectoral sanctions, where particular elements of a marketplace can be, act, can be impacted, whether through targeting a company overall, or if we don't want to target a company for an all-out uh, asset freeze and ban by limiting their future access to capital, by impacting their ability to receive, uh, to, to benefit from procurement, to receive the benefit of U.S. exports, um, development bank financing, etc. We have approaches to secondary sanctions where the U.S. system can limit access to correspondent banking accounts, take other measures to limit the access of the kleptocratic actors to the global financial system. <clears throat> um, and the, the sanctions tools that have been developed over the last, say, five to seven years have really shown how that can be done. But again, they can only really be effective if we have clear political direction and we have actionable information. The second category I'll focus on is anti-money laundering tools. Uh, People may be familiar with the Financial Action Task Force and Egmont Group, which act at the international level to set standards and establish uh, cooperative frameworks. But if we look at the range of tools that, say, our U.S. Financial Intelligence Unit, which is called the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, the tools they have at their disposal through uh, the Section 311 of the Patriot Act, the Bank Secrecy Act, give them a wide array of uh, a very precise and surgical means to get at particular kinds of transactions. For example, Section 311 of the Patriot Act has five what are called special measures that can be taken. Only one of those five has ever been used, uh, and it, even the one that has been used, only a part of it has been used. So the agency itself has barely scratched the surface of what can be done. And most of what can be done is actually simply to gather information, to require enhanced due diligence, to give law enforcement and regulators the power to understand how these networks are moving money, where they're moving network, and to more surgically try to, uh, to deal with it. Okay, the Financial Crimes and Enforcement Network also has the power to do something what are called geographic targeting orders, which they did recently in a very interesting way to target those uh, who are attempting to buy real estate in New York and Miami with cash to require those who are involved in those transactions to gather beneficial ownership information and try to impact how these transactions happen. Other kinds of tools, and I know I'm, I'm limited, uh, direct, uh, direct action with the private sector. Uh, because of uh, the way sanctions are impacting, uh, are impacting banks, as well as things like the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, conflict minerals regulation, uh, laws in the UK and California that require due diligence around supply chains for human trafficking, the private sector is more and more willing and able to act on specific information where it has actionable information. Two final quick thoughts. Uh, all of the tools I talk about often have a, can have a debilitating effect unless information is also used to mitigate their impact. Uh, there is a, often a problem of, of de-risking where when a, an action is taken to affect a particular country, private sector or even governments will 
over comply and refuse to do business in an entire region. The more we can develop actionable information, the more we can help facilitate the development of open channels so that uh, necessary business can be conducted. And finally, with the right actionable information, we can work to I think build on how what Alex ends his book at is is the develop of, of better governance systems. And as the the push comes from from below for proper systems that are properly regulated to development of information that can show how those can be uh, how can be developed and enforced. I'll Thanks. Thanks. Right. A lot a lot to uh, talk about. Let me just ask one question and then open it up, Alex. Because it, it seems to me that there is a, um, a suggestion, and I realize less in the book than in, in presenting it quickly, that the, the types of rewards that go on and the ways that loyalty is bought is highly personalized. That is, someone gets a lot of money. But the question is, what do they use it for? And in some cases, in, in the book and elsewhere, people use it for development of their community. Uh, so it, 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 that takes away some of the negative tone of it. And, and, and the question then is, is there a way to evolve toward a system where loyalties are indeed bought and sold in the marketplace, but the proceeds aren't all just put in people's pocket and sent, sent away? Shall I quickly respond? Yeah, and then we'll uh, I'll, I'll, I'll respond very quickly. Um, first of all, a, a generic point. I mean, when we talk about markets, we tend to talk about the profit motive. The key issue, um, and yes, there are people who are in these markets to line their pockets, and most, most politicians get wealthy. But the key point I want to make is that the, it is the logic of competing in a market that compels the monetization rather than the profit motive. If you go into one of these markets as an honest politician wanting to promote a political agenda to benefit your community or to create an Islamic state, you have to compete with, in, in, in the same way as in, if, you, if you want to be an ethical business person, you want to create a line of cosmetics that saves the rainforest, you need to compete with those who, who are in, in the business for profit, because you will be out of business within a month if you don't. Same if you, uh, the same principle applies. And, and, the, uh, and, and, and I wouldn't want, and, this, and then on to picking up on Brad's point, the political marketplace is not a criminal. There are criminals within it, but the overall phenomenon is not a criminal phenomenon. And I have this discussion over the years with Sarah Chase, who has this terrific book, Thieves of State. And, we, and, we, and we're continuing our debate on, on, on over the weekend. And, she, and she, her argument is that the Afghan state was taken, was, became a wholly owned criminal, uh, vertically integrated, wholly owned criminal enterprise. And I say that may be correct. But what, I'm in, what concerns me is you can take, you can deal with the criminality in that, but you're not going to, that is not dealing with the political marketplace. That is dealing with one element. What the political marketplace is, is, is mostly legal. Most of the flows of political finance are perfectly legal. Come from oil rents, they come from security cooperation, uh, uh, they came from political payoffs from friendly countries in the, uh, uh, in the Gulf, none of which is illegal. Most of the political money that is received by these leaders is recycled into patronage. It doesn't Political money does, is not corrupt money necessarily in, in their part, in, 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 in the vernacular. Some of it, may, some of it, it's, it's always, it is there to be creamed off, but most of it out of political logic is reinvested. It can be reinvested in a community, it can be reinvested in patronage, it can be reinvested in a militia or a security service. And, and, and this is the broader phenomenon. So I, 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 you know, I, I think the tools you're developing, Brad, are really important. But let's be, let, let's be clear, they're only dealing with a, a, a subset of, 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 of the broader phenomenon. And some of the more extreme cases, like South Sudan, where they are violent and they are kleptocrats, and you don't see, or, or the element of recycling is, 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 has been limited. Um, um, and then, uh, uh, Manal, I, I think one of our one of the phenomena that we see across the greater Middle East is that you have authoritarian systems that are highly regulated, highly controlled, like say Egypt or Tunisia or Syria, 
we dismantle them. We think we're going to get democracy. We don't get democracy. What we get is this free-for-all that is a political market. So the, 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 those dynamics of the buying and selling of loyalties, which have been within a system, then are released from that system. And, 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 and the trajectory is in, in, in the wrong direction, which is tremendously demoralizing to, to Democrats. And we need to find a way of, 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 of uh, either redirecting this, um, this political liberalization, which is becoming monetized, back into a more uh, regulated political realm, or um, structuring those transitions differently so that, the, um, th so that we don't get that deregulation to begin with. Thank you. Let me now open it up. I'm sure there are people with lots of questions. And please uh, give your name and your affiliation and make your questions questions. <coughs> uh, who would like to go first? Gentleman right there, please. Do we have a microphone at all? Oh, go to the microphone. Then, uh, and, and others who might want to go may want to start edging toward the microphone. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I want to commend you for your presentation. Okay. Identify yourself, please. Yes, my name is Wal Bakwal. Uh, I'm an ambassador. I'm serving in South Sudan Embassy here in Washington. Uh, I want to commend you, Alex, for your uh, book. Uh, I think it's a very good book. And I have followed your writings throughout the past few years, uh, especially your interest on Sudan. Uh, so I feel that you have done justice about what do you think uh, about Sudan? Uh, what I fail to see in your presentation is uh, your comments about South Sudan. Uh, as somebody who was born in South Sudan and lived in South Sudan and understand the politics of South Sudan, uh, I feel uh, this point of uh, buying loyalty may all the comments you have made about Sudan are, are in place, but in South Sudan it's very difficult because uh, in our situation, and you made some comments about our, our president Salfa Kiir as somebody who has not been able to manage the, the, the problems in a way that he could have done to buy loyalties. But my question is that, or my comment is, there are some people in the world that you cannot buy. You know, you need to understand the people you are dealing with you need to understand their motivation as to why they are doing what they are doing. And in my opinion, what happened in South Sudan from 2013 until now is because some of the actors could not be bought. You see, and I also want to agree with the comment of my sister from Sudan that South Sudan politics is very complicated. 40% of the population of South Sudan. I, 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 do, I do have to apologize. Yeah. We're going to have a lot of questions. So, so yeah, so I think uh, your comments about South Sudan may not necessarily be entirely accurate, but I still want to commend you for your work. I, I think you <laughs> did a good job, and uh, <laughs> maybe try to learn more about South Sudan. Thank okay. you. Uh, all right. Uh, do we have? I'm going to take more than one question, Alex. If that's okay. Do we have another question, gentlemen? Way in the back. Yeah, you with the glasses. With the... Can you stand up and speak loudly? Uh, that's an interesting follow-on mm. to the other question. And the gentleman right here, and then this one here, and then we'll uh, have Alex answer. Yeah. My name is Johan Sandra, and I'm a graduate student at Georgetown University. I'd like to commend the special professor Alex as well, and the other person who's graduate here. My question is, you spoke about in a particular uh, phase of your presentation how there was one president who encouraged corruption to such an extent that the concept of buying loyalty uh, became diminished, started to diminish. So what is this threshold at which, you know, the concept of buying loyalty itself diminishes uh, because it's, it's incredibly murky. If you can, uh, if you can elaborate yeah. on that, I think. That's a very good point. And the gentleman right here, and then I'll take some more after that. Um, David Troop from CSIS. Um, I regret to say I haven't read your book, Alex, but I found your presentation absolutely fascinating. 
and my brain was learning about how you might fly to Kenya or Uganda or mm. indeed the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and then I had a sort of second thought. It's very clever and it's, it's very dynamic and, and, and powerful, but does it actually, speaking as a political scientist, advance us much beyond the idea of neo-patrimonialism? That basically what you have come up with is a more concrete version of neo-patrimonialism. But if you were to apply the concepts from you know, even the 60s and the 70s, um, you would arrive at more or less the same conclusions, uh, except your diagrams make it extremely fascinating and powerful. Mm. So I'd be mm -hmm. interested in your ideas mm. about that. But going on from that, it seems to me that the logic of what you're suggesting is that the whole concept of the Washington Consensus and the structural adjustment and the policy agenda of the 1980s, early 1990s, was actually the West shooting itself in the foot, that it actually undermined what was a pretty coherent system and destabilized it and led to the eruption of violence. Uh, and and I'd be interested in that. And then finally, uh, the last speaker. Yes and no to your points, because it seems to me that the ability of the West to determine the operation of the global economy is contracting. You have all these funds in the Middle East, you have China, you have India, you have perhaps other rogue elements elsewhere. And given that, does the, the agenda that you outline actually provide a mechanism to control these flows of resources? Or is it in fact irreparably damaged? Good. We've got a lot of rich questions. Uh, okay. and then we'll come Thank you. All excellent uh, points. Let me let me take them in, in reverse order. On um, um, one of the sort, one of the book, one of the sources I draw on actually is is Bob Bates, who has this terrific book, When Things Fell Apart, which basically argues that the combination of economic mismanagement by African governments and austerity in the 80s and 90s made the the basic function of governance impossible so that those in positions of power were forced into predatory short time horizon activities and 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 so I, I, I see that yes as uh, as a contributor um, to this so that African countries have rebounded from that crisis but they've rebounded in a different form they've learned some very hard lessons as it were they the imprint of that crisis is in the DNA as they've come back so they've come back as uh, as as governmental systems extremely well attuned to responding to crisis at the expense of, of, of so they're able to manage crisis much less good at building institutions and that's also a response to globalization. Is it different from neo-patrimonialism? In many respects, I, I, I absolutely take your point. And in fact, if you go back to Stanislaus Andreski, you know, who coined the term kleptocracy in modern political science, I mean, it's, it's fascinating that his definition is not the lay person's definition of kleptocracy, which is stealing. It is, it is the application of the principles of supply and demand to, pub, to the operation of public office, which is slightly different. And, and, and uh, uh, which is, a, 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 again, a, a slight difference in the way we use the term kleptocracy. Um, so, yes, I, I take that point, but I think, you know, I think maybe you can say breathing new life into, uh, into neo-patrimonialism, saying how, how, how it's relevant. Which brings me to the, the, the question of the, the price of loyalty in Somalia and how Siad Barry. Basically, because um, of two factors, as I would analyze it, one is that he was not in a position to regulate the price of loyalty, so that however much he paid, he was just pricing himself out of his own market. Um, and secondly, because he was rather inefficient at doing it. He didn't have control over those institutions that were, that were regulating and administering those payments so that people were able to take them and get away with doing whatever they wanted. So in those circumstances, there was a very heavy discount rate of, of, of patronage payments. They translated into a very small quantum of loyalty in, uh, under those circumstances. In other circumstances, much better. 
Now, South Sudan, Mr. Ambassador, there are some people who can't be bought. I think that's, I, I think that's true. And in fact, I, ha I would take uh, a, a comment from uh, Salah Ghosh, whom you know as the former head of national intelligence and security in Khartoum. His complaint was that however much we pay, we're not going to be able to pay enough to buy off the southerners. So, yes, there is an element of that. But I think internally within South Sudan, I'm afraid, that my analysis of the system is that there was you know, quite some rush to self-enrichment uh, and also for, um, for money to, um, to support uh, uh, political bases. It became very... Um, from a system that was hardly monetized at all, and, I, and, and uh, Manali mentioned Yusuf Kua. I mean, there were political leaders from the SPLM, SPLA in the 80s and 90s who, 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 who operated without money. And, and Yusuf Kua's joke was when he ran for election, he took the money of the Jalaba, but then told people to vote however their conscience did. did. Dictated. This is what he used to say. Um, and so there were people who couldn't be bought. But the system became so rapidly over-monetized after the CPA, I'm afraid it became uh, corrupted. And then the, the, the really difficult question, <laughs> which I have no answer, where do you go from here? I mean, if, if you apply the, the, this logic um, in the most straightforward way, the answer is the only way that you can that you can achieve a political settlement in South Sudan today unless you radically transform it, which is not being done. Let's ha I mean, we can talk about radical transformation, but it's not being done, is whoever is in charge needs to have enough money in the kitty, enough political budget to secure position. And you see what happened to Salva Kiir. He's bankrupt. You know, he has no money. The price of oil is low, the production is low, he's mortgaged most of it to oil companies. So what does he do? He needs to create something for his, 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 his base, so he creates a lot more jobs in the, in the system, creates 28 states. He's handing out jobs. It is an act of desperation because it is the, the, the logic of survival in the system demands that he does that. And we're not helping him. We're trying to impose a, a model of, 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 of governance which, however well-meaning, I simply ain't going to work in these circumstances. And, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a collective problem. I'm, I'm, you know, we can point fingers as to who's to blame, but the, the, the problem is we are in a, a really a structural mess in South Sudan without an, 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 an easy way out. But did you want to comment on David uh, uh, Yeah, just briefly. I mean, in some ways it gets to the point that Alex made in, in response, which is... You know, I think we can probably take each case and have a discussion about how much of the network uh, is criminalized versus how much is just a general political network. Yeah. I think from our point of view as the century, it's it's about impacting that that aspect which is criminal uh, and and the just degree to which you draw that line can be debated. I, I mean, certainly there is some diminished role of the West, uh, and, and really what we're not trying to you know. We're not, what we're trying to do with the century is not really control the financial systems or control the way these uh, these systems work, but rather to impact to impact that crimin that criminal element of them. And that no matter the somewhat, and again, we can argue about how diminished the role the the real financial role of the West is. The simple fact is that the U.S. dollar remains the currency for most of the important transactions that are happening with the either the rents going in or the way the proceeds are taken out and because of that and that can will I think be the case for a long time the US financial system has tools to operate with in order to impact you know any transaction that happens in US dollars will almost a certainly have at least for a moment a nexus into the United States and there is a way to Increasingly, to surgically try to impact those, and and we don't you don't need to control the entire economy in a way that, say, comprehensive sanctions would try to impact. Um, but by disrupting, by disrupting the way those transactions happen and disrupting the decisions that go into uh, the way those those political entrepreneurs, as they're described in the book, operate, uh, you change the you change the calculations uh, and you change. Perhaps some of the way that the, the patronage is, is distributed and is taken in the first place. Do we have other questions from uh, yes, gentlemen there and then there, right, right, uh, right there. there yep, yeah, yep. 
Uh, Tom Wayne, I run a consultancy called... Stand, oh, stand up, it's, no. it's easy. Uh, <coughs> my name's Tom Wayne, I run a consultancy called Aware International. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, Alex, you talked uh, a couple of times... That a simple version of your argument is that the leaders just sort of funnel the money out. They get the money in, they funnel it to whoever needs it. But you talked a couple of times about regulating the marketplace, and there's... There's some other sort of like building a marketplace, building an institution of a market that seems to be going on as well. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how uh, leaders are doing that and what tools they use for it. And then there was someone right, the, the person with the cap on. There we go. My name is G'day. I'm independent. Uh, I believe that you didn't shade a, a good light into the Ethiopian development. The development... Ethiopian uh, development aid, which uh, averagely a year like three to four billion dollar international aid, uh, sixty percent of Ethiopian budget, sixty percent. This is documented; it can be proven. is based on the uh, international donors, whereas the government uh, is a tyrant and. Uh, committing genocide and atrocity towards their people last December, by alone last December, a month ago, 140 people were killed. 450 people were, Anyuak people were massacred. And uh, about uh, several of them in the Bahar, the Bahardar were massacred, several were uh, uh, wounded. Where uh, this, I believe that, do you believe that the uh, U.S. aid or European aid, uh, if, it, if it is based on humanitarian uh, conditions, would have been better off. It doesn't correlate with the U.S. constitution or with the international laws. And I feel like, I don't know, I haven't read your book, I look forward to read it, but I feel like you missed that point. You, I thought in your brief statement you were trying to shed light regarding of Melles as a, a one who brought development. The country is uh, just like in a time bomb about to explode. Okay, we, I, I appreciate that. Uh, we didn't have a lot of time on Ethiopia, and so perhaps you can go into it more because you, there is more in the book on it. Why don't you take those questions, uh, Alex, and then we'll okay. see what, because time is, we, we, so, Susan, we're we 12 o'clock, is that? Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so we only have two uh, Regulating the market, I mean, that, that's a really interesting topic, and I will briefly say that um, the, the key elements over reg regulating, which are entry, um, regulation of political finance. If you can actually get those who, who are involved in providing political finance together to, to have a consensual uh, dispensation of that political finance, then I think then that, that, that is a key uh, entry point. And, 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 uh, and I would... Uh, and I would say, the, 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 you know, in response to what Brad was saying, I mean, those instruments are, you know, are only part of what we should be looking at. We should be looking at a much broader uh, recognition that these that these countries are rely on political finance that is partly generated internally, partly externally, and 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 how. Uh, how are we to regulate political money? I know that's a huge debate here in the United States. It also ought to be the same debate needs to be conducted internationally because uh, by regulating political money, you regulate how the market works. The other thing is communication. And, and, and uh, I didn't go into how the communication and transport revolution has actually transformed the bargaining power of those in the peripheries and, 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 and those who are subalterns. So it's no, it's no longer possible for, or it's much more difficult for whoever is at the center of power to set the terms, the pace uh, of bargaining and control the information. And, and, and in doing so, the skills required for those at the center are that much greater, but also the political expenditure becomes that much more greater. The markets become that that much more expensive. So there's a whole lot of of, of very interesting um, policy challenges which we haven't even begun to really scratch the surface of. Ethiopia, um, I think Ethiopia is in a very interesting moment. Uh, I, I was in Ethiopia 
just last week, and I, tra I made the same journey that I'd made um, 12 years ago from Addis Ababa in the south. And it was extraordinary. I mean, you know, I traveled on a six-lane expressway out of Addis Ababa, um, uh, dr passing under the high-speed train tracks that are going to be opened. You know, it was the, the, the infrastructure of the country is being transformed. There's no question about that. The political governance is, 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 I think, in a very interesting moment at which the highly centralized rent allocation that was undertaken by uh, late Prime Minister Melis Sanawi is breaking down. And um, Melis was very explicit that he, that he was not interested in eliminating rent, but in allocating rent. Now, his successors, therefore, have a huge amount of resources in their hands to allocate. And uh, given that none of them has that same centralized you know, command over, the, in, uh, over everything that goes on in, the, in, 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 in investment and development policy, it become, um, the system is becoming more like a, 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 a cartel of different uh, power centers, each of which is, 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 is allocating resources. This is likely to lead to a, a sharp increase in corruption. It does not mean that the developmental project is going to be derailed, but it will take on a, 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 a different character. And the, the, the extent to which in that transition the, uh, the voices of the people can be heard so there can be a democratic debate is going to be really challenging because one of the things that happens when you centralize power in a single party with no opposition is that party rots from the middle. It always happens. And, and, and this is the challenge of Ethiopia. How, how do they prevent that rot at the center, given that the, that the EPRDF is politically dominant? Otherwise, it will be in, 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 in trouble. How about the development of the Italian? Well, I, I, I think. Well, I think, unfortunately, mm. time is running out, but I, uh, I appreciate that we should have, you know, if we had more, we could have spent hours on this. Uh, and Ethiopia, there is a long section on Ethiopia in the book which uh, I have a lot of questions I would ask about Ethiopia as well. Time has run out. But uh, Alex, I want to thank you. I want to thank, no, thank Brad. But Alex, your book is very challenging. We're grateful for your being here at USIP. I, I think we could come back and, and go over these issues even more on another occasion. But I do suggest that this uh, book is a, a very provocative one, and one that I think in a number of different ways, not only understanding the systems, but for us at U.S. Institute of Peace and other institutions like it to think in maybe new and more creative ways about how we deal with the, 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 the phenomena of violence and how it is part of this system and that some of the ways we get at it may not, may not be as effective if we looked at it in the context of the system that Alex raises. So thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. I'm sorry we've run out of time to discuss it, but uh, this is the beginning of a good long discussion among all of us. Thank you very, very much.